good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Here we go. Praise the Lord. Everybody sing praise the Lord. Together in unity, to praise the Lord, praise the Lord. How good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity. When we lift one voice, loud and strong. Come on, band. Conversation, would you just say hi to somebody in your left or right? That's too long. Oh, you stand in this love. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Come on, church! My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. I fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Here we go. She no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to your life. I'm not afraid to leave the past behind. Why? I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Every 
God, this morning, I pray that you would invade our hearts. And God, you know how to invade each of our hearts. You know what to whisper in our hearts. I pray that we would be attentive to what exactly you want to do with us. God, this week, there's been so many voices that have been bombarding me, and voices of life, voices of discouragement, God, sometimes voices of encouragement, and sometimes I know for me, your voice diminishes. It gets smaller and smaller. God, I pray that today, right now, your voice would be the loudest. God, that we would hear it so so clearly that it's unmistakable that's you talking to us, encouraging us, lifting us up, pushing us, convicting us. Lord, waking us up from a, maybe a spiritual downfall. Whatever it is, God, be strong in us. And we ask that. And because we know what you need to say. You know us so intimately. God, I pray that our life, our words, how we give, how we serve, how we love would magnify you as something within us. So God, I pray that we'd have that heart this morning. In your name, amen. So we're going through, we're looking at key figures and how God used those men despite those men, despite their failures. And we come up to Moses and we saw last week that Moses had this burning passion, maybe a calling, if you will, to see God's people delivered from Egypt. And so he took it upon himself to be that deliverer. And he went and he killed a guy. And there's videos of it or movies. Um, I'm not sure how Charlton Heston did it. I don't remember. But there's this idea that we make it more palatable by making it seem like it was self-defense or he's just protecting the guy. But if we really break it down, the text says he looked this way, he looked that way, and he whacked him. He killed him and he buried him. Moses was a murderer. And God's like, you know what? I take the passion and the desire, but that's not how we do things. And Moses then spent the next 40 years in the wilderness. And the wilderness for the Christian is kind of a, a difficult thing to understand, but it's basically that time where you're out there trying to figure it out. You're trying to learn. And in many cases, what God is trying to do is actually exhaust you of your own flesh and get you to a point where you actually trust in him. After 40 years in the wilderness, by now he's married, he has a son, Moses Jr. has been born. God appears to him in a burning bush. 
the great I am. Now, Moses, are you ready? Because I'm going to commission you and send you back. You will be involved in freeing my people. And Moses was ready. He was time to go back. In our time today, I want to look at a couple of elements as Moses begins to step into ministry. And whether you view yourself as like, yeah, I'm going to step into ministry, or whether you just realize that your first and foremost ministry is to your family. Either way you look at it, whether you go, no, I got the Sunday school class, or I'm a pastor, the worship leader, I serve in the band, what we're going to learn from Moses is you got to get your house in order First, you have to do a a self-assessment and get your house in order. We're just a mess today. We're going to get it together ourselves as we watch Moses try and figure it out. (laughs) I promise. So let's look at some of what we're going to do. A realistic assessment is what Moses needed to do. You see those lists of all the horrible things in Scripture that God's people did. I was looking at one this week, and to Moses they attributed what? Oh, he was a stutterer. No, he wasn't. It's not a true statement. We misunderstand things. He was a murderer. We need to assess our own families as we begin to prepare for whatever it is that God has for us. And then honestly, for all of Moses' shortfallings, we end today, I was writing this message, I wanted to just stand up and cheer. Dude absolutely arrived and nailed it. And I pray as we look at this, that we are bold enough to stand in front of any audience anywhere and proclaim truth in the face of death. He gets to a point, a little spoiler alert, he warns Pharaoh face to face as the mouthpiece of God. Powerful. But despite this calling, despite everything that he has going on, he's scared. He's timid. So God literally is like, okay, I want to prove a point to you, Moses. Take this staff, throw it on the ground. Watch this, guys. Take this staff, throw it on the ground. It's going to turn into a snake. Okay, mine's not. We know that, right? Yeah, we're good. (laughs) I will point out, I find it fascinating. This was carved in remote jungle of the world from people that have never heard the word of God. Where do they come up with a serpent on a pole? Common denominator, yes? Yes. Moses stood face to face with Pharaoh as a mouthpiece. Moses stood face to face with Satan's mouthpiece. God told Moses, put your hand in your pocket. Pull it out, it had leprosy. Put it back, it healed it. This is a calling I would die for. I would die for. It didn't happen this way anymore. The book's done, this is your calling. Wouldn't you love this? But despite that, he's like, "Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I I can't do this. Let's pick up the story in Exodus chapter four. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes the deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I? This is a powerful text on the sovereignty of God. I made your mouth. The whole idea that you suck in my air, process it in your lungs, and then exhale it, that's me. I do that. I make mouths. I open them. I close them. I make eyes. And yes, I make some people born blind. I'm the sovereign God of the universe, Moses, and I'm commissioning you to go and do ministry. Would that not put more hop in your step? Not with Moses. Now go, he says. You got this. I will teach you what to say. (laughs) But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. (laughs) Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. That's, that's, That's a little eerie, right? I mean, the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. Wait a minute, back up. We have some of the most powerful text. I make the mouth, I close the mouth. I make the eyes, I close the eyes. I'm the sovereign God of the universe, and you know what else I do as God? I make suggestions. (laughs) Have you got him in a box? How big is your box? Open the box and let him out, seeing that he is wonderful. You know God from the narrative, not from some definition. My goodness. Talk about meeting a man where he's at. How about Aaron? All right, Moses, he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you. 
and he will be glad to see you. But the reality is, Moses didn't do a self-assessment. He was not being honest with himself, and he was not being honest with God. We have to understand sometimes as we interpret the Bible, it is the inspired word of God in its original form. We translate it, we missed a few things, we're doing really well. We're like 99.0% spot on, and whatever we misunderstand, just a little something on the side, don't get nobody in trouble. The ex- absolute inspired word of God. But it does include people's nonsense, and we want to make sure that we don't read their nonsense and lies as absolute truth. The reality is Moses had probably the equivalency of a PhD out of Egypt. So Stephen, first deacon in the church, right? What do deacons do? Stack chairs, stuff like that? Not Stephen. He gets the chance to preach. So Stephen jumps up with some fire and brimstone, and he lets his Hebrew audience have it. And he tells them their whole story, and it's a story of failure. And at the end, of course, he takes several rocks to the head, and off he goes to heaven. But this is what Stephen says about Moses. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Moses was lying. He wasn't being honest with himself. He wasn't being honest with God. God met him where he was. Fine, we'll send your brother with you. And I love that because we all need brothers. I need brothers. I need someone to walk with me. But there comes a point where I realize, you know what? Christ in me. I can fulfill my calling and my burden if I would just take a self-assessment, stand up, and let truth go. How many Christians like, well, I'm not real gifted in evangelism. I don't know that you get an exemption card. If you can find one, write it. Here, I'm excused, Lord, because I don't speak well. Find a context out of which you will share the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as humanity's only hope. That's your ministry. That's your calling. And when those people believe, you walk with them to help them function and begin to restore themselves from life in a broken humanity. That's our calling. That's what we do as a church. Well, I, 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 yes, you can. And if you can't verbally, find another way. If that doesn't work, drag him here and I'll do it. We have a responsibility. And the idea that we wouldn't be honest with ourselves, Moses was not being honest with himself. And you know what this is? This is a beautiful time and a beautiful context to be reminded of this. And we got it in its proper context. Boom. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can do all things. The context is the difficulties of ministry. I had an incident yesterday. I don't know what happened. I've done this numerous times, but I was prepared to do some ministry. I had a funeral. I had our community group praying. I felt good. And things just went south really fast on me. I couldn't figure out what it was. I had to step back. What is going on here? And that's what rang true to me. What your little malfunction is, slick, step up there and proclaim the words of eternal life. And by his grace, I did. My knuckleball wasn't working. My curveball wasn't cutting but I proclaim truth. Yes, you can. We understand the importance of this. But when you're ready, when it's time to step out and begin to do some ministry, you cannot leave the family behind. And that's the second lesson here. Ministry starts first at home. So Moses goes back. All right, cool. My brother's going to be there. Going to go tell Jethro. It's time to go. Got the wife, got mini Moses, and we're hitting the road. And off he goes. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you one of the oddest texts in the entire Old Testament. On the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. That's a great start to ministry. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She touched his feet with the foreskin and said, Now you're a bridegroom of blood to me. When she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. What do you do with that one? Moses was a Hebrew. Moses was an Israelite. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He knew full well that God had given the Hebrew people the covenant of circumcision in Genesis chapter 17. A lot of people think it came with the 613 commands of the Mosaic law. And since Jesus fulfilled the law, 
that we don't need to do circumcision anymore. First of all, if you're a Gentile, this was never given to you. This was a particular and special covenant to the Jewish people. And here Moses is ready to go tell the world there's a problem and be the savior, but he hadn't even cleaned up his own home. And his wife was not happy about it. And many Moses, flint knife, that's a broken piece of rock. He wasn't real happy about it either. This is a perfect example of how many of us are so gung-ho to do ministry, and I am so guilty of this. They told a story uh, at seminary, not uncommon at all. This young seminary student shows up. He's just doing it all as fast as he can, learning everything, writing papers. Comes home from seminary graduation, and his wife's gone. Every single one of his textbooks has been thrown all over his bed. She packed her stuff and had flown home. We're so enthralled with ministry but we aren't doing ministry in our own home. He should have ministered to them first. He should have brought his son underneath that covenant. He absolutely failed. And you might stop and think, so like that just gets you killed? Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, in the Old Testament. So even you're like, oh, this Jesus thing is cool, but I like to follow the rules and please God. You wanna be a legalist? Chew on that. You don't get that. That is harsh. That is hardcore. That is preparing us to drop to our knees and take the grace of God in place of any meritorious system. He was being prepared to minister under the law. But you know what, guys? Dysfunction in Christian homes, dysfunction in Christian marriages is absolutely destroying the proclamation of the gospel. Statistically speaking, a man is more likely to disqualify himself for ministry than he is to embark on a ministry. And you know what? I don't know how we hold Zippy there. What's her name? Zipporah accountable? But it takes two. Pretty disrespectful. Instead of, hey, babe, doesn't your God require you to circumcise? No, she flings it on his feet. Gentlemen, you are to lead, you are to shepherd, you are to love. And ladies, you are to respect and respond to that. And what this is, this is a miniature little train wreck on the way to ministry under the old covenant. But the same thing happens today. And I think, you know why? Because we have such horrible role models. And I think biblically we look back, but we ignore one thing that happened in our country. And it's called the Industrial Revolution. See, if you're Mrs. Ingalls, good for you. You can stay home and take care of things. Charles will go out and do the crops and do all that. Well, this isn't Little House on the Prairie anymore. This is the real world, where in most cases, women have to go and work. But what we do is we still put the burden from all the kids and the entire household on her at the same time. I watch my daughters. Jaden's pushing him away. They're kissing on him and wanting to baby him. They have a God-given instinct to nurture. I love that. It's right there in the scriptures. That's the way it's supposed to be. But there comes a point where when she has to work too, and we just think we can just sit around and do nothing, and she has to do absolutely everything. No way, gentlemen. And some of it is because of this misogyny, which is partially real, and because we had poor role models in our homes, I mean, I thought it was completely normal. We heard my dad's truck coming. I went to his keg of beer. Mom went to get him a paper plate full of food. I mean, that was just the way it is. We didn't function any different. We didn't know better. And I had a Bible teacher. I love the guy. But he sat there in Bible college until the whole thing, when he comes home from work, he goes to his chair and she brings him his slipper and newspapers. I know I've shared that before because it still bothers me that that's what we're telling young fathers, that she has to bring you your slippers and your newspaper. You are to be a servant leader in your home. You take care of things at home first or it goes no further. And in this case, she had to do it. Dysfunction. Then you go, well, where do we get a godly example of a husband? Let's go back and see what we've learned so far. Abraham, uh, no. Isaac, no. Jacob, oh, please. Where do we go? Where do we find the example of a good husband? Right there. Right there, gentlemen. Christ is your example. I don't want to be considered a bridegroom. Well, you are anyway. 
That's your example. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is your role as a father. You get that straight? And ladies, you are to respect that. Biblically, you are to respect that and to respond to that. Now we can function. Now we can do ministry. You know what they did? Because later the text says Moses had to call for his wife and call for his son to meet him. I'm guessing he hobbled, but back they went. And Moses had to continue on alone. But I also want to take a minute here and talk about this idea of circumcision and why it is so, so important we understand it, especially in light of the New Testament. Probably the best example I have ever heard comes from Chuck Swindoll. And he says this, circumcision was a physical mark of their obedience to God who planned and designed their procedure. In this unique demonstration, a man said to God, my family, my heart, my home are dedicated to you and set apart for you, O God of Israel. It isn't just a little procedure, it's what the procedure means. Sounds pretty reasonable. You know what gets really challenging to understand is, and we saw that during our series in the book of Philippians, where Paul warned us, you watch out for those Judaizers. You watch out for those guys that just want to carve people up. See, Jesus was opposed by the Pharisees. Paul was opposed by the Judaizers. Everywhere he went, they pursued and followed him. And their message was, unless you were circumcised, you cannot be saved. The early church dealt with it. If this is fascinating to you, I would encourage you to read Acts chapter 15, the book of Philippians again, and the book of Galatians. What's really fascinating is that most people would look at Chuck Swindoll's explanation there and suggest to you that that is actually what saving faith is. When you consecrate and set your whole self apart and promise God that you will obey him and consecrate him to you, when you added that to the gospel, Paul called you anathema. Anathema, cursed, false gospel. Why is that? Because he will not have you take your unregenerate, an unbeliever, and have them put their foot forward and consecrate somebody to a life of obedience without being born again. You're taking an unbeliever and telling him to commit, and it happens all the time, all the time. Commit your life to Christ. What does that look like? Well, just obey him. There it is all over again. The unbeliever is taking himself going, okay, okay, I get it. God loves me. I don't want to go to hell. I'm going to embark on this and I'm going to obey and I'm going to be good enough Christian to really be a Christian. And you have unborn again people in the church. Save that for your diet. Go all in on your diet and your workout routine. Save that for the first of the year and your new resolution. To the unbeliever, he can do nothing but believe or trust in the person that's who is Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. It requires you to, in a sense, spiritually, absolutely drop to your knees and admit you have nothing to offer. Then, and only then, are you prepared to receive the grace of God and the forgiveness of sins. That is the gospel. It is by faith, not by consecration of an old person to new principles. That is why Jesus said you must be born again. And he said nothing even close to that as the requirements to be born again. It is by faith because you literally bring nothing to the table. And then you go, wait a minute. It doesn't depend on me at all. Not at all. There's nothing I can do to earn God's favor, love, grace, and forgiveness. Nothing. Then there's nothing I can do to lose God's love, favor, grace, and salvation. Nothing. Nothing. You are but a recipient of the gift of eternal life. Somebody is amen. Amen. Absolutely. Now, you watch this transformed man go into ministry. Moses and Aaron arrive in Egypt and they confront Pharaoh. And this is where I think Moses becomes Moses. The man, the devil himself wanted his dead carcass when it was over. This was the man right here. Check this out. Exodus chapter 7, the Lord said to Moses, pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. 
Tell Aaron everything I command you, and Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart hard, stubborn, so I can multiply my miracle signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Even then, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, so I will bring down my fist on Egypt. I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites from the land of Egypt, with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord Yahweh. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord Yahweh had commanded them. Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 when they made their demands to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, excuse me, Pharaoh will demand, show me a miracle. When he does, say this, Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord Yahweh had commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. I was unable to capture that today. That's probably a good thing. Do you know who his audience is? Right up boldly into the face of Pharaoh, and he threw down the gauntlet as a mouthpiece for God. It's about to get real, Pharaoh. You watch. You watch what my God is going to do. The battle of the ages. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. All right, how many of you had that whole poltergeist moment when you were a kid? Little girl in front of the TV, and I'm like, I still have thoughts about that sometimes. Picture yourself in that moment. He grew up, he knew. He knew of Pharaoh's magicians, he knew of all this nonsense, and now there's this confrontation, and somehow, some way, Pharaoh is able to produce this as well. And you know what? If Moses didn't get it, we knew to now. We don't battle against flesh and blood. We're not battling against just Pharaoh. He's standing face to face with a mouthpiece of Satan and proclaiming Yahweh. Aaron snake devoured the devils. God will always win in his providence, in his sovereignty. And yes, even the God who makes suggestions to you will win. Victory is his. We are just the messenger. We are just the mouthpiece. But how bold how Moses now become standing right there in front of Pharaoh. Powerful, powerful text. But Pharaoh, uh -uh. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He still refused to listen just as the Lord had predicted. That's okay, because you know what God's got? He's got over the next several chapters to prove himself, and that's exactly what he did. We see, I'm not gonna go through all of it, we're not studying the book of Exodus, but you see these plagues. The Nile turns to blood, there's frogs, there's gnats, there's flies, there's livestock, there's boils, there's locusts, there's hail, there's darkness, and what God is doing is he's showing the world, you have your little false pagan deities, and they are inspired by Satan himself, I will trump every single one of them, I am the great I am, and he systematically used Moses to crush the fake deities of Egypt, so that the world would know. Did you get that? So that the world would know who Yahweh is. Will they know through you? Will they know through me? We have the guts of Moses, they will. Now watch this. Watch this feeble, broken old man who said, oh, I'm not eloquent in speech. I can't do this. And I'll let you read through it yourself. But you know what Moses, you know what Aaron's job was? Aaron was supposed to be the great masterpiece. No, no, here, shut up and hold this, Aaron. Who did the speaking? Moses did. Moses did. Yes, you can, Moses, because I'm with you. And listen to this. 
Pharaoh summoned Moses after one of these plagues and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses' response. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave you to the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs except for those that are in the Nile. Tomorrow, would that be okay, please? Would that be okay, Moses? Like Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know there is no one like my God. There is no one like Yahweh. What dignity he offered this guy. You ponder this, Pharaoh. You're not going to win, and you're not going to win. You go ahead. You process this. You chew on this, and you let me know when you're done. You let me know when your knee bends, and I'll call it off. Not elegant in speech. I don't know, to stand up and cheer. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And so Moses does. Moses intercedes, and lo and behold, Pharaoh, good politician, does the old flippity flop. So here we go again. Exodus chapter 8, another confrontation. Moses answered him in this confrontation, as soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord and tomorrow the swarms of flies will disappear from you and your officials and all your people. I love this. You ready for this? But I'm warning you. Do you get that? I'm warning you, Pharaoh. Have you warned anybody? I'm warning you. Don't mess with God. Pharaoh, don't lie to us again and refused to let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord, Yahweh. Stood face to face with the Egyptian God, son of Ra in his mind, got right up into his face with Yahweh, very God himself in his corner and said, I'm warning you, you stop it because hell's coming down. The consequences are real and we have to. We have to be willing to speak of the consequences. And so many times we just prefer the message, well, ask Jesus into your life and things will be hunky-dory. I don't want an amen on that. I want a nonsense on that. That is not the truth. That is not the gospel. The gospel is, is that you have one hope, and that is Jesus Christ. And should you reject him and not believe on him, you will stand before that same God. And I'm warning you as well. You have one hope of heaven. Will you warn somebody? You know what? I didn't have my curveball breaking yesterday, but I stood in front of 75 people with a coffin next to me and I warned them best I could because that's the gospel. And if we won't do that, shut the door. It's the powerful, in your face message of Moses. This little old man who can't speak, I stutter and I'm uncertain. He wasn't being honest with himself, was he? No, he wasn't. So Moses left Pharaoh's place, pleaded with the Lord to remove all the flies. If you're going to warn somebody, you've got to pray for them. We have to intercede because the darkness that Moses is facing that stands behind Pharaoh is the same darkness that has blinded the unbeliever, warning them, loving them, but you've got to pray for them. Pray that somehow, some way, God would remove the scales and allow them to see the absolute beauty of Christ crucified on their behalf. Warn them, be firm, and pray for them. Pharaoh says to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Yeah, good luck with that. Didn't take to the warning so well, did he? We're done here then. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. And the scary part of evangelism for those that die in unbelief is there is one last voice. Is there not? Could there be one last voice to that lost person at some point as they reject the gospel and their own heart becomes harder? That door closes and it becomes too late. In the final plague, God says in Exodus chapter 12, now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of the month for you. 
It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbors are to, are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb is to be unblemished, a year old. Take it from the sheep or from the goats. Keep it until the 14th day of the month, and then offer the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of the host, of, excuse me, of the house in which they eat. He continues on in verse 29, it says, Now it came about that at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh's who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was at the dungeon. The only ones who did not lose the firstborn are the ones who had applied the blood of the lamb to the doorpost. And when judgment, the final judgment came after the final warning and the final rejection, get out of my face, Moses, it's too late. Judgment will come, and it did come. And the only way that it was passed over is not because the Hebrew people were more moral. It's because they applied the blood of the lamb, and they were passed over. They applied the blood of the lamb. There is probably no greater portrait of the gospel than that right there, and that is why I suggest to you Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. You know what? The band's going to come up and we're going to do another song. And, and as, the, as we do that, the ushers are going to come and we're going to take these elements. Because you know what? Our Jewish friends were told to do. Once a year, you celebrate this. Once a year, you look back and you remember that Passover. You remember the source of your salvation from Egypt. All your struggles throughout the wilderness, all your struggles throughout your years, it's all normal. It's all part of the process. But once a year, you come back and you remember what is the true source of salvation. It is not you, it is the blood of the Lamb. Please take the elements and hold them, and then I'll come back up and lead us in the time of the Lord's Supper. Before the throne of God above a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest who in love, whoever lives in peace with me. My name is graven on his hand, my name is risen on his
perfect, spotless righteousness, great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. Christ is our Passover, fulfilling the Passover, building off of the idea of the Passover. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took, took bread and he broke it, and he demonstrated for us our version of remembering, our version of looking back and commemorating our own salvation through the Lord's Supper. And he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is a symbolic of my body which was broken for you. Broken on the cross, crucified, laid open so that divine blood might cover you. Let's take and remember, it is the body of Jesus Christ. In the same way he took the cup, it says, symbolic of my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance. No chance we forget, right? Remembrance says, it's not me, it's him. Remembers that I'm absolutely, totally secure in him. He does not offer temporal life. He has given past perfect tense the gift of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. And you remember that with the cup. And if there's no, somebody here who doesn't understand that, I'll split a maple bar with you. We'll go out there and we'll talk this through. You've got to understand this. It is Christ crucified and nothing else. He is our Passover. Father in heaven, God, I thank you so much for the cross. Thank you for your son. And as we look back on Moses the murderer, it doesn't matter anymore. We look back on Moses' failure to do ministry in his own family and some of us can totally relate. The dysfunction God is everywhere and we want to work that out. We want to grow like Moses did. But at the end of the day, for us broken people to hold the cup, to look at the cross and to know that we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins without regards to our failure is so powerful. Thank you so much for that. I pray everyone would ponder your goodness and your grace and truly appreciate who you are and what you've done. And Father, as we close our time, the ushers would come forward. Those who wish to also worship through offerings may do so at this time. And would you take what's given? Would you multiply it? That, yeah, we got to pay a bill and do the things that church has got to do, but would you somehow, some way, put within us what Moses had? That we would proclaim, we would warn, we would pray, and we would watch what you do, Lord. God's people said, Amen. We're going to bring this song back.
When sorrow comes to steal your eye home. When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken We sing My fear doesn't stand a chance When I'm standing your fear doesn't stand a chance When I'm your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Come on! Oh. All right, here we go, church. She no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to your I'm not afraid to leave the past behind And I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't have a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love There's power that can empty out of it. There's resurrection power that can say power in your name, power in your name. Sing it again. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out of it. Stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. I am standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Yeah, you believe that? Hey. One last thing, and I'll race you to the donuts. Men's breakfast, sign-up sheet. There's a couple of them out there. I want to get together, the men in this church, um, a couple reasons. I need help. I'm just telling you flat, I need help around here. There's various ministries and things that we need. So what I want to do is I want to ask all the men to come. There's ingredients. We're going to do breakfast burritos and just talk about what it's going to take to do outreach and to do ministry here at the church. So that's going to be August 20th. So um, next weekend, Annie's going to bring the word. My wife and I will be celebrating 29 years up in Monterey, California. So, but I would love to see this happen. So this week and next, please, uh, in the sign-up sheet. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thank Have you. A great week. You got more? I'm really out of source today. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>
Doesn't stand a chance when I 